I guess men are a little bit stubborn sometimes. Ladies out there, do you agree with me or not? Yeah, are we a little stubborn? Oh, well, no need for all the enthusiasm. All right, simmer down. We're whatever. We're a little stubborn, I'll admit, at times. Okay, but, but there's good reason for our stubbornness. You see, as men... We don't want to put our weaknesses or insufficiencies out there. Right? We don't, that doesn't need to be on display for other people to see. And so, because of that, at times, we can posture ourselves to be a little more stubborn. We don't always want to admit when we're wrong, okay, perhaps. We don't always want to ask for help or ask for directions. Noted, that's fine. Uh, I would agree with that. Uh, because, hey, we're men, right? We can take care of things. We got it covered. We're good. Uh, this is perhaps one of the reasons why I don't like to go to the doctor. Any other guys with me? I just, you know, for me, it takes a lot for me to go to the doctor or want to go to the doctor. I don't want to do it because I'm good. I'm, I'm a man. In fact, even when it comes to my family, I don't like to tell them when I'm not feeling good. I just don't want to tell them that. So it drives my wife nuts all the time. She'd be like, hey, are you, are you feeling kind of sick? And I'm like, no, I'm fine. She's like, you're not looking so good. And then it'll progress eventually. And then she'll be the one like, hey, maybe you should go to the doctor. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm fine. Drives her nuts. I do that all the time. And I'm, any other guys do that, right? We, that's the way it works sometimes, right? I, I admit that. I don't need help. I'm good. I got it covered. I'm fine. I don't need to see a doctor. That's my mentality. And that's a lot of guys' mentality. In fact, that's, that's the way that many people tend to think just about life in general. In fact, probably many more people than just men at times, there is a, a sense of pride deep down that all of us have that in many ways it blinds us to the reality of our true condition. Pride is that thing that lives deep down in our hearts and it tells us these lies that we believe and pride is the thing that tells us that we're good, that we're fine when the truth is we're not always fine. In fact, we aren't fine at all. The reality is all of us have an illness. All of us are sick. All of us have a, a virus. And it's far worse than we realize. But see, here's, here's where the value of Jesus comes into the picture. Jesus came to reveal the truth and to set the record straight. And if you want to see this this morning, if you want to move aside your pride for a moment and hear what Jesus has to say, I want to encourage you to listen and to do that, let's turn to, to Mark chapter 2 this morning. Mark chapter 2. If you came here this morning and you brought your Bible, great, you can turn there with me. If you didn't bring a Bible, you're welcome to use the Bible in front of you. Uh, if you don't own a physical Bible, that Bible in front of you is yours to take home. Or you could give it to a friend if they need a Bible, that's fine. But Mark 2 is where we're at. And if you don't know where the book of Mark is, it's in the New Testament. Three quarters of the way into your Bible, you got the book of Matthew, then it's Mark. If you hit Luke or John, go backward. Mark 2 is where we're at. And we are continuing a series that we started a couple weeks ago called Follow the Leader. This is a series in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where we examine the passages where Jesus says to people, follow me. And so we're working through a number of those different passages. So far in our series, we've looked at a gospel, the gospel of Matthew and the calling of uh, Peter and Andrew, James and John. We looked at that the week one. And then last week, we were in Luke's gospel for a little bit. And this morning, we're going to be in Mark chapter two. But, but, but by the time we're done, we'll be in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and bouncing around quite a bit. But we're in Mark 2, and today we're going to be looking at the calling of an individual named Levi. So if you're there, we can get ready to dive in. But before we unpack that text, I just want to do something very quickly. I want to give you the immediate textual context for our story today. So if you notice, in Mark 2, in the beginning of the chapter, we have a man who's paralyzed. And in this story, Jesus is in a city called Capernaum. It's near the Sea of Galilee. He's in a home. He's teaching. He's preaching. And this group of guys, they hear about Jesus. And so they take their friend who's, a, who's paralyzed. And they put him on this mat, on this bed. And they carry him to Jesus. And they go and they climb up. And they lower this man down through the roof because there's crowds of people all around Jesus. And they, they lower this man so that way Jesus will heal him. And when Jesus saw the tremendous faith of all this man's friends... Jesus said to the paralyzed man, I love this. He says this, son, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And, and immediately after this, these religious leaders, when Jesus says this to them, they're incensed. They're, they're filled with rage because for them, this statement that Jesus makes is completely blasphemous. I mean, think about that. 
For this man to come here and say he's going to forgive sins, that outraged these religious leaders because according to them, only God had the authority to forgive sins and they didn't believe that Jesus was God. And so they were super upset at what Jesus says and in, in response to that, notice what Jesus does and what he says. He says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. He says this to the religious leaders. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And immediately the paralyzed man, he's healed, he gets up, he takes his bed, and he walks all the way home. So this is our textual context. Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, he is the one who has the authority to forgive sins. This is the point that we're meant to be thinking through as we move into our text today. That Jesus can forgive sins and that Jesus does forgive sinners. Store that in your mind and heart as we move through our passage. Jesus, the Son of Man, he has authority to forgive sins. And now that we know that, we're going to move into our passage. And in our passage, we're going to be introduced to a notorious sinner. And his name is Levi. So let's go ahead and get ready to jump in. The first thing we're going to see, number one, is the opportunity for Levi. This man is going to have an opportunity of a lifetime. And so notice what happens beginning with verse 13. Our story begins talking about Jesus. It says, He, meaning Jesus, went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. Now, just a heads up, uh, in the previous chapter, Mark chapter 1, Jesus had already been hanging out by the Sea of Galilee. In fact, we preached about that. Uh, I preached about that in the, the first week when I talked about Matthew's gospel in the calling of Peter Andrew, James, and John. Remember, Jesus was by the Sea of Galilee and he started calling these fishermen to himself. Well, in Mark chapter one, it tells that story. So Jesus had been in Galilee already. And in the region of Galilee, he, he's calling disciples, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's doing miracles. And in Mark chapter one, if you notice, verse 28, it says this about Jesus, that his fame spread everywhere throughout that entire region of Galilee. So Jesus, at this point, was drawing large crowds, Right? Uh, we saw that in the story with the paralytic. There, there are crowds all around him. Uh, here, as we move further into chapter 2, the crowds are still all around Jesus. He's becoming something of a, a local celebrity at this point. So in this region, Jesus is very popular. And in the midst of this moment where Jesus is once again walking by the Sea of Galilee, people are all around him. Notice how in this moment, Jesus stops and he sees someone. He spots someone in the crowd and notice what it says Jesus does. It says, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Now, from our vantage point, this seems like it's not that big of a deal. Sounds like just something really simple. Jesus is walking, sees some dude by a tax booth. He says, hey, come here. The guy says, okay, and he does it. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal. However, this is because we're divorced from the cultural and historical context of what this means. So remember, the Bible is something that was written for us. It wasn't written to us. And we aren't the culture or the society that lived when the Bible was written. And so in order for us to understand how the Bible is for us, we have to understand the original audience and the people that Jesus was ministering to. So from our vantage point, it might not seem like a big deal, but from the first century vantage point as a Jew, this is a significant thing that's happening. So let me just uh, bring you up to speed with some history and some culture. So at this point in history, the, the, the people of Israel, they were under Roman rule. In fact, about 100 years before this story took place, Pompey came in, he invaded Jerusalem, and eventually this Hasmonean dynasty. So if you know anything about Israel's history, they were in Babylon in captivity, and that changed hands to the Persians, and then eventually they were... Um, released from captivity after 70 years under Cyrus. And, and during this time, when they were released from captivity and back in the land, the Jews had a, a brief period of time where they were governing themselves. This is known as the Hasmonean dynasty. However, after Pompey took over Jerusalem, he replaced that Hasmonean dynasty with a king, King Herod the Great. Okay, you probably know a little bit about King Herod the Great. He's the guy that built a bunch of things in Israel. And he was also the crazy guy in the beginning of the birth story of Jesus who wanted to murder all those babies. That was Herod. Now, Herod was technically called the king of the Jews, but in all reality, he was a puppet king for Rome. You see, the Romans had brought him in. They said he was the one to govern, but really he was doing everything that Rome was telling him to do. 
Uh, and so during this time, Israel functioned as kind of like a client state of Rome. But eventually, after Herod the Great's death, this is shortly after the time of Jesus' birth, uh, his sons started fighting for power. And so power was kind of dispersed in that region, and, and there was a lot of unrest. And so as a result, Rome officially decided to, to take that region of Judea and place it under direct administration of the Roman Empire. Um, and so here's the point. At this point in history, Rome had all the power. They did allow the Jews to do some kind of pseudo uh, governing for a little while. They had some religious leaders who they gave some power to. Um, but really the truth was Rome was in control, right? I mean, they were the ones that were in charge. Like it or not, the Romans had control of Israel. And I've talked about how Roman occupation was miserable for the Jews. I mean, life was miserable. But one of the reasons why it was so miserable is because the Romans taxed the Jews Incredibly, if you uh, don't like your taxes today and you feel like taxes are too high or you want to grumble about that, if you lived in the first century, you wouldn't be grumbling quite the same way because this was absolutely atrocious. The Romans, uh, who taxed the Jews from kind of a distance, right, because Rome had a big empire, what they did was they charged the people for everything. There were land taxes, poll taxes, income taxes, even temple taxes, right? This is the Jewish temple. And so they would pay taxes and then that, those taxes would go to Rome. And so they paid all kinds of taxes. But here's the thing, because the Roman Empire was massive and it was so widespread, Rome didn't send Romans all over the place exacting that money. What they did in some of these other regions that they occupied is they hired locals. So the Romans hired a bunch of Jewish people to be the ones who would collect the taxes for Rome. Even though Rome was the enemy, they would find different Jews and they would hire them. And so if you think about it from that vantage point, a tax collector, a Jewish tax collector living in the first century, they were somebody who worked for the enemy. They were considered to be traitors, right? They were despised by the people. In fact, not only that, they were also known for being people who were kind of like thieves because most Jewish tax collectors, they would collect taxes from the people to send to Rome, but they would collect extra money to line their pockets. And so in order to be very rich, what they did was they sold out their own people and as a, as a result, they were viewed as like the worst kinds of people you could imagine. A tax collector was like the lowest of the low in Jewish culture. Now, there were different types of tax collectors. Uh, the, the type of tax collectors that collected the income taxes and the land taxes, those were known as the gabai. But there was another type of tax collector, those were known as the mokes. Now, the mokes, uh, a chief mokes, was somebody who they actually uh, purchased a tax franchise from Rome, and they would employ these lower, these smaller uh, mokes, who would actually be the ones that would gather the money. So an example of a, a chief mokes would be Zacchaeus. He's a chief tax collector. And, and they would employ all these different people, and those people would have booths. So the only people that had a tax booth was a lower mokes, a little mokes. And that means that Levi happened to be one of these guys. So what they would do is they would have these booths. They would set them up all over Israel in areas that were really heavily populated. And they would shake people down for anything or everything. It was a very arbitrary system. So if you had a tax booth and you saw somebody who had something, you could exact from them taxes however much you wanted. You just kind of could pick, pick the figure. And so... So it's, it's no surprise that Levi is here by the Sea of Galilee. Why? Because he sees all these fishermen out there. They're bringing in all these hauls of fish, and he goes, oh, I guess I can make some cash off this. And so when they bring in their fish, he says, all right, you got to pay taxes on the fish. Notice what he does? Notice what, what's going on here? This is who Levi is. He's a guy that people would consider to be evil. He's a sellout. In fact, sometimes these mokes, what they would do, there's some history you can read about this. If they saw somebody with a donkey, they could just arbitrarily say, hey, have you paid taxes on the donkey? Where's your paperwork? And if someone didn't, they could take money from them. And if they couldn't pay the, the money for taxes, you could actually seize the donkey on behalf of Rome and, and sometimes replace it with a lesser donkey, an older donkey. This is the kinds of things they did. I mean, they were crooks. And so Levi was somebody who not only betrayed his people, but he profited greatly from the betrayal of his own people and from their misfortune. Levi was somebody who was very wealthy, but his wealth couldn't buy any kind of esteem in the eyes of his, his other Jews. They hated him. In fact, uh, if you know anything about the culture at the time, tax collectors were complete outcasts. 
uh, in that culture, according to the law of the Pharisees, you weren't even allowed to associate with a tax collector. In fact, they were viewed as perpetually unclean. A tax collector in that culture wasn't even allowed to enter the synagogue or give money to the temple because their money was viewed as corrupt. And so this is who Levi is. The worst of the worst. In fact, this is how bad it is. If you know anything about Jews and Gentiles, Levi would be deemed worse than a Gentile. Hear this. He would be deemed worse than a Roman soldier. That's how Levi was viewed. He was hated. And so notice what's going on here. Despite his past, despite his reputation, despite his sin, Jesus is walking, sees him, wants him and says, follow me. Think about the gravity of that for a moment. What Jesus is doing is is unfathomable. Now remember, we've already established before in our series that for Jesus to say, follow me, this was an invitation from a rabbi, from a master, to invite someone to become a disciple, a follower of that teacher. And and it was not only just him inviting people to follow his teaching, it's also an invitation for these disciples to participate in his ministry and to participate in the kingdom. This is what Jesus is doing. And so for Levi... This opportunity, perhaps for the first time in his life, he encounters somebody in society who looks at him, knows who he is, knows what he does for a living, and sees past that and says, I want you. Follow me. Now, in society today, we know that for young people, um, life is just different with the rise of the internet. I didn't grow up with social media, and I know that today, largely, that plays a big role in children and the development of their kind of understanding of socialization and social status and pecking order. And so oftentimes today, right, in our culture, uh, people will post things, and if they get lots of likes, right, that'll you know, kind of build them up and give them some self-esteem and, and kind of boost those endorphins in them, and they feel good about themselves. But if certain people don't like things, right, the stuff that happens online, that's often how we determine where we're at socially today. That was not my era. Uh, My era was very different, like many of you. I grew up before the internet, and so for me as a child, I remember very clearly how you determined what your pecking status was. It was at recess. Uh, I've talked about this before, right? It was maybe a game of kickball, and the two most popular, biggest, toughest kids, they would say, hey, I'm captain. And if anybody argued with them, right, the biggest, toughest kid would win. So you'd have two team captains there at the top of the hierarchy there, and then they would begin to choose who would be part of the team. I was never at the top. I was never chosen first ever. Uh, I was usually, fortunately for me, somewhere in the middle, which made me feel all right about myself. Um, If it was like a small team, maybe it was three and three basketball, I might not be chosen, but usually I got picked to play somewhere in the middle. But we know that at the, the end, there were some kids who maybe were picked last, who felt bad about themselves. And at times there were kids who weren't picked at all. Uh, Maybe the teams were uneven, or maybe just somebody said, I don't want you on my team, and so I'm not going to pick you. I don't care. And, and, And maybe some of you, you know what that feels like. That's Levi's life. Nobody would ever see him and want him. Nobody would choose him to be on their team. He was hated. He was despised. He was a nobody. And yet now, for the first time in his life, someone sees him. And wants him. And this invitation to come and to be a disciple, this is an opportunity for Levi to to transform his life. And he seizes this opportunity, right? Immediately he rises and he follows Jesus. And in that moment, he leaves behind his career. He leaves behind his checkered past. He leaves behind everything that really dragged him down before. And now he aligns himself and joins himself to Jesus and his disciples forever. And he commits himself to this new kind of life. It's incredible. And just for the sake of clarity, it's probably helpful to know that most commentators believe that Levi is the other name of Matthew. And so uh, he would be one of the 12 disciples. A lot of commentators, they believe that, that this guy is one of the 12 disciples. And so this is the guy who wrote the first gospel. Now think about the significance of that. Levi, the very man who would have been shaken down the fishermen, 
Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they knew who Levi was. He was the guy that was every day hassling them about paying their taxes for the fish they were collecting and giving it to the enemy. They knew who Levi was. And yet Jesus said, hey, you're going to be part of this crew. Think about that. Even more so, think about this. One of the guys who was one of the 12 disciples was Simon the Zealot. Zealots had a a, a posture in that culture. They were the extremists, the radicals. They hated the Romans so much that they would often try to do these revolts and uprisings. And so here, Simon the Zealot, he joins this crew and he happens to see this guy, Levi, who was partners with the enemy, who he's rubbing shoulders with and doing ministry with. Think about just the significance of the fact that Jesus chose Levi. You think any of the other disciples would have chosen Levi? Nope. But Jesus sees him and he chooses him. And for us, this is incredible. It's a reminder that Jesus chooses the least likely candidates, those who are broken, those who are a mess, those who are despised, those who've ruined their reputation. Those are the people that Jesus sees loves and chooses. Now for us, when we think about that and the kinds of people that are welcome to the kingdom, these broken, screwed up people, we, we love that. We say amen to that. But the reality is there are people who lived during this era who did not say amen to that. And so now that we've seen, number one, this opportunity for Levi, this opportunity of a lifetime to join himself to Jesus, the second thing we need to see now specifically is the opposition and outrage of the religious, right? These people uh, who see what Jesus is doing, they don't appreciate it. There are certain people, religious people, who are completely opposed to this. So notice how our passage continues now, picking up in verse 15. It says this, and as he reclined at a table in his house, meaning as Jesus reclined in a table at Levi's house, it says many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, as our story continues, notice that Levi brings Jesus to his house, and clearly Levi is somebody who's made a lot of money ripping people off because he's got a big house. How do we know he's a big house? Well, he's able to invite many tax collectors and sinners over to his house, and they're sharing a meal. Now, the question we should ask is, why would Levi invite a bunch of sinners and tax collectors to his house? Think about this. Why? Well, because they were his only friends. Normal people Levi was not allowed to associate with. He couldn't even be around them. And so the only people he's allowed to be around are people like him. People with soiled reputations, people who are unclean. He had a bunch of tax collectors around him. He probably had other people who were marginalized in society, prostitutes, what have you. All these people are the people that he knows and he has any kind of relationship with. And so he invites them to his house. And this group of friends are scoundrels, traitors, outcasts, swindlers, sinners. This is his crew. And there at his house, he he has this ragtag group of people he invites over. They throw a massive party. In fact, it's more of a formal party. How do we know this? Well, it's like a banquet because we see that Jesus is reclining at the table. Now, in Jewish culture, if you ate a normal meal, you wouldn't recline. That was more for formal meals. That was important meals. And so we see here that this is a very special gathering, probably in honor of Jesus, that Levi throws and he invites his whole posse. Right? He invites all those sinners and tax collectors to come over to his house. They're the ones at the party. But who are the people who don't come to the party? That's what I want to ask. Well, notice how our passage continues. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? You see, inside the party, you got a bunch of people who were happily sharing a meal with Jesus. But outside the party, you got a bunch of people who were pointing their fingers at Jesus. And they ask each other, why does this guy eat with sinners and tax collectors? Now, this is a valid question, right? If you lived in this culture during this era, that's a common question. After all, one of the laws of the Pharisees was this idea that you shouldn't associate with these people. And so it makes sense that they would say, well, why is Jesus, this teacher, this religious leader, why is he associating with people like this? Doesn't our law teach against this? This is absolutely scandalous in the eyes of the Pharisees. What he's doing here is culturally taboo. 
And these religious leaders who were there that day, this, this faux pas in their eyes is beyond comprehension. It's reprehensible. It's shameful. And they're totally outraged at what Jesus is doing. And so we have to ask ourselves, why? Why would Jesus choose to do this? Why would he associate himself with people like this? Well, that leads to our third and final point. Now that we've seen this amazing opportunity for Levi to become a disciple, and now that we've seen the outrage of the religious who see the people that Jesus is associated with and they're outraged by it, the third thing we need to understand is the objective of Jesus. Why would he do this in the first place? Why would he go to the party that day? Why would he associate with sinners and tax collectors? Well, he explains this in the next verse. It says, and when Jesus heard what the religious leaders were saying, he said to them, those who are well have no need of, of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, I want you to think about this just for a moment. In response to their question, Jesus has a beautiful illustration. Jesus says this, hey, the only people who are going to go to a doctor are people who are sick. Now, we understand that. That makes sense. And in the same way, the only people who are going to go to Jesus are people who realize that spiritually they're sick. They're sinners. You see, Jesus had a mission. He was sent to the earth to save sinners. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was what? Lost. That's the mission of Jesus. He came to earth to save the lost, to save sinners. And how does Jesus accomplish this objective, this mission? Well, by giving his life. This is why we continue to read in Mark's gospel, Matthew's gospel, Luke's gospel, John's gospel. What does Jesus do? Well, at the end of the story, he goes into Jerusalem and he willingly allows himself to be seized and arrested and they take him and they put him on trial and they make accusations against Jesus and he doesn't open his mouth. He doesn't respond or retaliate even though the, the trial is unjust. Jesus has done nothing wrong. And then they beat him and scourge him and they take him and they make him carry a cross to the place of the skull. And there Jesus is nailed his hands and his feet to this cross and he's lifted up and everybody's mocking him, berating him. And there Jesus is gasping for air and he suffers and he bleeds and he dies. Why? To save sinners. That was his mission. The Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. That's why he died. And perhaps there are some of you here today who you look at the totality of your life, you look at your past, you look at the decisions you've made, and you begin to look at your own life and you realize, man, I've really made a mess of my life. Or you think about your past and you have all sorts of guilt and shame about the things that you've done and you feel like nobody will ever want you or love you and, and, and maybe you just have a view of yourself that you're just this wretched sinner. I want you to know this morning, I've got to say that if you've lived your life like a tax collector, I want to say no matter what your past is, no, no matter your reputation, no matter matter what you've done, Jesus offers you a seat at the table. He invites you to be part of his kingdom. Regardless of how bad you've been in the past, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness, it's greater than your sin. And there's room for you, sinner, at the table with Jesus. And we hear that good news, and I think most of us, again, we would say amen to that. But here's the thing. This is only part of our story. It's only half of it. If you stop and think about our story this morning, really there are two types of sinners in our story. Think about it for a moment. Here in Mark chapter 2, we have two types of sinners. One group of sinners was at the party with Jesus. But the other group of sinners never went to the party. Think about it for a moment. The Apostle Paul, he tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No matter who you are, the reality is all of us are sinners. And so if that's true, then that tells us there are two types of sinners in the story. So what's the difference between these two types of sinners? Well, we've got to think about that. The guys at the party, they realize they're sinners. Why? Well, because people have been telling them that their entire life. 
They've been outcasts. They've been rejects. People have not been wanting to be around them at all because they're sinners. That's their reputation. What's the difference? The guys at the party, they realize they're sinners. But the guys who are not at the party, they don't. That's the difference in our story. Jesus came to earth to save sinners. He is the great physician. He came to heal the world from the virus of sin. And the truth is, everybody's sick. Everybody has the virus. But only those who go to the doctor in repentance and faith can be healed. Do you understand what I'm saying here? The guys at the party knew they were sinners. And so they went looking for a savior. But the guys outside the party, they thought they were righteous. And so they never did. Instead of entering the party, they stayed outside and wagged their fingers at Jesus. And beloved, as much as I would love to have a message where I primarily just focus on the fact that, you know, there are some people out there right now who are significant sinners and you've made a mess of your life and there's grace for you. I believe that's true. And I've already declared that there's room at the table for you if that's you. I just feel the nagging sense that I need to focus on the other group this morning and to be really clear with them because I don't just want to talk to people who know that they're sinners. I want to take time now to talk to those people who think that they're pretty religious because you also need to hear the truth. There are some of you out there who've lived lives of self-righteousness. In your pride, you have done everything right. You went to church your whole life. You followed the rules. You checked off all the boxes. You looked the part. You act the part. You dressed the part. And let's be honest, when you compare yourself with those around you, you're a pretty good person. Most people would say, yeah, you're a great guy. Great gal, good person. I resonate with with that person. I grew up in an environment where when I was really young, the church I went to was a little more legalistic. We would preach salvation by faith alone and the grace of Jesus. We would preach that. But many ways, in many ways, we would practice that what saves you is not just uh, grace, it's your works. It's doing the right things. It's following the rules, right? So often people would pray the prayer and they would get in. That's their ticket to heaven. But to stay there, you got to follow all the rules. And so what happened in this legalistic environment is it came, Christianity became not so much about who I was, it was about what I did, or maybe even more so what I didn't do. In fact, in some of these circles, and you might know what I'm talking about, people focus more on not what you should do, but what you shouldn't do. And those kinds of churches are more, are, are more known for what they're against than what they're for. So I remember I have this distinct memory. I was maybe second grade. I remember going to school. I remember sitting down. I remember thinking in that moment, I have to be good. I have to be good right now. Like I have to do the right thing. And that was so ingrained in me that I remember that experience to this day. And so if that's you today, if you're the person who's done good your whole life, You've checked all the boxes. You've done what you needed to do. I resonate with you today, but I want to speak from a place of, of, of shared experience from my own life as well. I want to speak to your heart and let you know, man, do not let your stubborn pride keep you from coming to the table from going to the party. Don't act like I do when when my wife asks me how I'm feeling. Oh, I'm fine, I'm good. You're not fine. You're not good. You're sick. You've got a virus. It's called sin. You are a sinner. We all are. And we need God's grace and we need to repent and we need the great physician. So stop trusting in yourself. Stop relying on your own self-righteousness. Don't allow your pride to keep you from entering the party. Beloved, listen, there's room for everybody at the table. There is room. I want to challenge you today, whoever you are, to repent and run to Jesus. If you spent your life as a sinner, repent of your sin and run to Jesus. And if you've spent your life as a saint, Repent of your self-righteousness and run to Jesus. We all need him. All of us. We all need to run to our Savior. This this truth that we should see today, it's very simple, but I, I think this is what we're supposed to see from our text. Everyone needs a Savior. Clearly, Jesus came to save those who knew they were sinners. But through this message as well, we're meant to see that there are people who don't think they are. 
And that's why they stand out of the party and they're so judgmental. We're all sick. We all need Dr. Jesus. We need Jesus MD. I'm telling you. We need him. So don't let pride get in the way. I just want to wrap some of this up by reading a parable for you. This should be a well-known parable. Luke chapter 18. It's no coincidence that we have a parable with two different people who are two polar opposite uh, perspectives in that culture. We have the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Maybe you've heard of it. And so notice who Jesus tells this parable to. It says in Luke 18, and he told this parable to some, notice this, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. He told this parable for those people. And here's the parable. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and one was a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. Notice his posture. But the tax collector standing far off because he knows it's sin. Standing far off, he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified, righteous, saved, rather than the other, rather than the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So listen, Christian, if you're the religious person in the room, repent of your pride and self-righteousness. Humble yourself. Realize the gravity of your sin. Realize you're sick. And run to Jesus, because the truth is, everyone needs a Savior. So regardless of the fact that maybe you've done everything wrong, or you've done everything right, run to Jesus, because everyone needs a Savior. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this morning. You are a good and gracious God, and we are so thankful that you are the God who welcomes sinners to the table. Your grace, your love, your mercy, your heart, it is so incredible. It's beautiful. And so often um, some people struggle with that. But Lord, I thank you that that is your heart. But Lord, I know that your heart is also to save those who are religious which is why, as we see in the story, we're going to see even more so in some of the coming weeks. You often take those who are religious and you help them to see the reality of their own indwelling sin. We all need a Savior. And so, Lord, for all of us today, I pray that we would repent and run to you and to your son, Jesus. Lord, I want to pray for the person who's done everything right, who's followed the rules, who's said the right things, who's done the right things, who feels like on their own merit they've earned something before you. Lord, I pray that you would strip them of their pride and their religiosity, and I pray that you would reveal to them the truth, their desperate need for your son, Jesus. We all need the doctor. We all do. May we have eyes to see it. So Lord, I pray that through the power of your spirit, you would reveal that truth to our hearts today and draw sinners to yourself. For your own glory and for our own good, we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.